More than a year into the pandemic and the economic crisis it generated, many workers continue to be excluded from receiving any government relief. These excluded workers include undocumented people, many of them in essential services, and people recently released from prison. Well, on Monday in New York, hundreds of excluded workers from across the state marched to the capital of Albany in a final push to demand lawmakers support a $3.5 billion fund that would be the first of its kind in the United States to provide financial relief and health care to those shut out of the current system. Embattled Governor Andrew Cuomo is now in final negotiations with legislators on a budget bill that was due last month. New York Assembly member Marcela Martinez has joined excluded workers in a weeks long hunger strike urging support for the fund. She addressed Monday's rally. There is plenty of money, but there isn't a political courage to do the right thing. A Democratic majority controls both legislative houses in New York, and Governor Cuomo is a Democrat. If passed, the state's excluded workers fund could issue payments to as many as 275,000 people. Advocates say Governor Cuomo is pushing for a two-tiered system of access to the fund that would require burdensome proof of employment requirements for people who may not have access to bank records and pay stubs or other forms of identification. These are hunger striking workers Ana Ramirez and Felipe Adrovo. There are many excluded workers, not just me. We're thousands of families. We're babysitters, domestic workers, construction workers, street vendors. I lost my job last March. After eight years, my brother passed away. I was in the hospital with COVID. I lost my apartment in Woodside. I'm here to raise my voice and the voice of others. I'm in this fight in memory of my brother. For more, we're joined by New York Assembly member Marcela Matenes, who is, we reported, is on hunger strike with the excluded workers. Before her election last year, she spent a decade as a tenant organizer. She immigrated to the United States from Peru with her family when she was a child, and many of her constituents are excluded workers. She's also calling for a wealth tax. We'll get into it all. Assembly member, thanks so much for joining us. You're in what your 11th, 12th day of a hunger strike and the other people who some in wheelchairs rolled through the Capitol yesterday are in the third week. There are 21 days of hunger strike. Talk about what you're demanding. Good morning and thank you for having me. Um, you know, we're asking for $3.5 billion. Uh, that would be in par with what other New York State employees have received in unemployment benefits and also in uh, stimulus assistance. So we're asking for folks that weren't able to qualify for any federal or state assistance to be compensated in this way. For the money to be retroactive to April 2020 through September of this year, when the benefits are supposed to continue. And so what we're asking is to give folks an opportunity who are trying um, to get out of this pandemic, like we all are, who are facing obstacles that nobody expected, who are suffering at no fault of their own. Um, you know, I truly believe that this is the job of government. We're supposed to provide for our people. And this is a moment where we need to step up. Well, Assembly, Assemblywoman Matanis, uh, how would the Excluded Workers Fund uh, function, given the fact that many of the folks, as, you, uh, as has been noted, are not necessarily in the uh, employment system, per se, uh, in terms of verification, in terms of the number of children in their family? How would, the, how would this fund work, from, when, from your, your understanding of it? So— what we're what we're hearing and we're still you know we're we're still trying to fight this is it's a two tier system, the first tier getting the bulk of the money, um, but they have to have an ITN number. They have to prove, um, you know, they were employed. They want um, pay stubs. 
a letter for an employee, all things that are going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to produce. And the second tier who can't produce the things are going to get a very small, uh, a small amount. And so it just doesn't seem right that at the time when the city was asked to shut down, when people of privilege were able to, to shelter in place, um, that folks that didn't have any other options that needed to continue working did, uh, that were exposed, that then got sick. Um, it's it's just not right and it's not fair that they're not given an opportunity to, to fight this pandemic as well. And so to me, the fact that folks have gone on 21 days of a hunger strike to try and, and call attention to this, uh, this, this immense need, folks haven't received any type of assistance for over a year. And these are families with children, family with elders, and so what's ended up happening is communities have had to step in. And what we've seen is um, mutual aids come into place and try and provide and help where the government has failed. And so for those people that are on hunger strike for 21 days who are doing this, not just for themselves, but for all their immigrant uh, neighbors with, throughout the state of New York, it would just be a, a real shame that they would not be able to qualify for the assistance that they truly need. And the way that I look at this, this is not just giving them money, but this is an investment in our community, investment in our future, because they will then take the money and put it back into the economy, which is what we need. And this is a way that we can all begin to work together and thrive and get back on our feet. And how has uh, Governor Cuomo responded to this, especially given the fact of, uh, obviously, he was uh, citing a huge budget deficit uh, uh, in the coming years, but then there was a, a quite a bit of, of financial aid that came in President Biden's recovery plan. Is, what's your sense of the uh, how the governor is responding to the budget impact of, of these, uh, not only of this, but the rest of the budget that needs to be passed should have been passed by April 1. It should have been passed, yes. Um, let's understand that this governor has passed austerity budgets, and that's 10 years of budget cuts to truly important services and programs that hurt our most needy. And so his original proposal did not include a single dime for these excluded workers. And so what we're doing is negotiating and so we're hopeful. Um, the legislator had also, we had also um, proposed six different uh, bills to tax the rich that together would comprehensively change, um, not just the, the progressive tax system, but over time would start chipping away at that income inequality. And so what we're seeing is options on the table that are not fully being considered what we're seeing is where the governor's priority is, because what he is pushing through is a $1.3 billion project for Penn Station, where he's talking about building 10 office towers. I'm not sure how the people of the state of New York, who are still hurting, who are still in need, who still need much, much more, are going to take uh, to this budget with this proposal in it. And I'm very concerned. I want to go to Raina, an undocumented worker and activist with the immigrant rights group Make the Road. Uh, the group held a rally last month. I am scared right now because I owe two months of rent, and the landlord has been knocking on my door. I tell him, wait, wait, but he says, for how long? I am going to take you to court. And in all truth, I am very scared because I am struggling. I have a job for every eight days, working, making $80, and I can't live off $80. I am a household cleaner. I am excluded from government support. And so that has a big impact on me because I am a mother of two children. Assemblymember Matenas, I have a friend who went to get a vaccine uh, shot um, as a bodega delivery person. And they came up to him online and said, 
show me your pay stubs from the bodega. And he said, when was the last time you saw a pay stub from a bodega? And they actually oh. laughed. Ultimately, they let him go through. But this issue of documentation and what is needed in all aspects of life, and also this woman talking about rent, your history before you were an assemblywoman is as a crusading tenant organizer um, after your family lost their own home in Queens. Can you talk about that and how that fits into this picture? Yes. Um, actually, we lost our home in, in Sunset Park, where I continue to live. Um, and it's part of the community that I represent. Um, you know, I am I I deeply believe that housing is a human right. At the time that I got this place, my daughter was eight years old, the ho only home that she knew. And I had to sit down to her and explain to her what was happening. And that year, she learned two vocabulary words. She learned gentrification and she learned eviction. You know, people don't understand um, how violent being evicted is and the trauma that are, that instills in you and how you carry that with you. And so, you know, it, it breaks my heart to hear what's happening, although I'm also just very used to it. You know, we're hearing things where landlords are telling tenants they don't care that the governor has put a, uh, an eviction moratorium. That's their property and they need their money. They're being told you have credit cards, use your credit cards. And so what we're trying to do is really what we should be focusing on is providing basics so that folks can get back on their feet because what they want to do more than anything else is to be able to get back to work and pay their bills. But they can't do that right now. And I think that it's morally wrong for us, for us to ask these people to work during the pandemic and then now tell them that we can't assist you, we can't help you because you don't have the proper paperwork. Well, Assemblywoman, I wanted to ask you, you recently wrote an op-ed piece in The Independent uh, in New York where you talked about the the, the root of inequality in our state being a regressive system where, uh, of taxation. Uh, could you talk about the initiatives that are being attempted uh, in this budget to change that by some of the more progressive Democrats in the state? Yes. Yeah, so I mentioned that there is a comprehensive approach that we were trying to, um, to push, and it's six pieces of legislation um, that would begin to change the income inequality. And one of the things that I'm pushing in particularly is a change in the constitutional amendment that would allow us the ability to tax intangible wealth. And so what's happening right now is that because the state is not able to collect all the, it doesn't have sufficient revenue for its expenses and it can only collect so much in tax that it really, it really leans on the city to be able to fill in that gap. And so what we see and what I'm hearing, and I heard this over and over and over again through my campaign, was, you know, this issue about property taxes. And it's just gotten so out of control that it's, it's become a huge problem. And so every time we talk about taxing the rich, we get these lies and these rhetorics and this pushback about the fact that they're, the rich are going to leave. The rich left the city during the pandemic and went to their second home in the Hamptons. Let's be clear about who's leaving. The people that are leaving are working class New Yorkers, uh, middle class New Yorkers that can no longer afford their property tax, that are tired of sending their children to schools that are underfunded that are tired of the expensive health costs, uh, transportation costs, um, and the continued uh, budget cuts through this governor of much needed um, social services. And so what we should be focusing on and what this uh, legislation, along with the rest of the legislation was really trying to tackle, is we were proposing six pieces of legislation that together would bring in $50 billion of revenue for the first year and really setting down the foundation for ongoing revenue so that we can finally fully fund all the services that we need and start pre, uh, start um, uh, reinvesting in our communities because we all deserve to live in communities that are flourishing, not just folks that have money.